Well, good morning. How's everyone on this beautiful Sunday morning? Then let's stand as we call ourselves uh, to worship as we read from Psalm 95, uh, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let us remain standing as we sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Thank you. Let us remain standing as we recite together what we believe, professing as Christians as they do all around the world through the Apostles' Creed. Let us recite this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Hey, Chris, we just wished uh, Chase a happy birthday, so if you could pass that on. <laughs> All right, well, let us join our hearts uh, together in prayer. Fathers, we gather together this morning. We have so much to celebrate, first and foremost, because of who you are and the great things you have done. You've called us uh, together as uh, a body of believers, as a, a family of God, and uh, you've, you've saved us through the, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for your calling. We thank you for the sacrifice he made so that we might be reconciled to you and brought into a right relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for that. So we worship you this morning and we celebrate who you are and that you are our great protector. Father, we also gather before you to, to celebrate the fact that you're a God who still works in the world today and still works in our lives today. And we thank you for the privilege of approaching you uh, for prayer requests and uh, for the results that, that you give us. And I just thank you for Gail and the progress that she's making um, after her surgery and just pray that will continue and alleviate the pain that she's been struggling with. We pray for Peyton, Lord, and just ask that you will um, help her as she goes through the recovery process and help her to, um, to soon be able to dance like she's never danced before. So uh, bless her and, and be with her. Father, we pray for others who need your, your healing touch. We ask that you will um, um, comfort them, heal them, be with their families as they walk along with them. We pray for those who are uh, going through grief, and we pray for the healing of, of their grief. Father, we celebrate birthdays, and thank you for um, Chase, and we thank you for Anne as we celebrate them today, and um, others in our, in our congregation. We thank you that we can just join together and, and celebrate life, and that's what we do. We pray that our worship service will be glorifying to you this day and that your Holy Spirit will move powerfully among us. Heavenly Father, hear us now as we join our voices and our hearts together, saying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we, we serve a, a holy God, a holy God who's full of life and full of love, and the God who is our protector. And that's what we're going to look, about, uh, look at uh, this morning as we continue in our series on the Psalms. This week we're going to look at Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 is perhaps one of the most uh, beautifully written and, and one of the most popular of the Psalms. It's a Psalm about God's unfailing love and about his powerful protection of his people. The Zondervan NIV Study Bible wonderfully describes Psalm 91 as, as a glowing testimony to the security of those who trust in God. Uh, a, a testimony to the security. We're safe in the protective power of God. Psalm 91 is God's way of telling us that whoever trusts in him and seeks his divine protection will be saved. In 2020, when COVID-19 swept across the world, fear and anxiety gripped hearts of people all around the world. No one seemed safe anymore, and everyone was searching for methods of protection. Today, we face new and different challenges, but still dangerous challenges all around the world. But in times of crises, children of God can find encouragement and comfort in the promises of God. One passage, you know, our, our passage this morning is one such passage. As I look at social media today, often you find uh, quotes or maybe even the whole, the whole psalm, uh, Psalm 91. I find it's often quoted in people reaching out to bring um, comfort to others. There's that birthday boy. Happy birthday, Chase. <laughs> but... Um, through this sermon, I'd like to share just some, some more thoughts about uh, God's protective care of his people. First, uh, just a, a, a brief background word. You know, as, as we've looked so far in the Psalms, there are 150 Psalms. Um, most of them have clearly defined authors. Uh, we, we've seen... Um, David and Solomon and Moses and Asaph and Koran and Heman and Ethan. Um, these are some of the authors that are mentioned, you know, at the beginning of the psalm. It'll be a psalm of David, and he wrote a whole lot of them, as you know. But some of the psalms don't have who the author is, and Psalm 91 is one such author. The NIV Study Bible says that it was probably written by one of the temple personnel, like a priest or, or a Levite, who worked in the temple and saw this, these daily sacrifices and God, God's power among the people. Um, and it was written as an assurance to the worshipers of God. But isn't it amazing that one of the most common, one of the most popular, one of the most beautiful of psalms, uh, the author is unknown. You know, it's amazing how God sometimes works, isn't it? Even as the author uh, wrote the words of the psalm under the anointing and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he was inspired by God, I believe, as all the authors of the Bible are. Uh, he probably never dreamed the impact that his words would, would have. Um, just to think that as he wrote this um, thousands of years later, and um, millions of people would be impacted by the words that he penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this should encourage us to know that whatever we do for the Lord can have an impact much greater than we would think. You know, we can do one little thing, but it can, it can continue to impact. It can even be passed on from generation to generation. 
you know, teaching our children when they're young the things of God, um, instilling in them biblical values and principles, and they carry them on from generation to generation. That's how our faith is, is called to work. There are, it's said that there are no uh, grandchildren, you know, in, in the faith, that, um, uh, that there has to be an individual decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. I can't make that decision for any of you. It's an individual decision, but we have to instill, and especially when our, our children are young, it's never too young to um, communicate the principles of God's Word um, upon our, our people. So we, we live in a society, we don't know how our good act, one act we do, might impact others. And so I believe in our world today, we're desperate for Christians to, quote, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they were old, they will not depart from it. And I believe we, many, many adults need uh, discipleship as well. And I think people today, at, at any time, when there's a crisis I think people are more open to listening and hearing. They're more open to hearing uh, from the Lord in the midst of a, of a crisis. And so this psalm is a good psalm to share with someone going through um, trials and, and tribulations. Um, but be sensitive at the right, um, the right place and the right time. Don't come and bang the Bible over somebody's head. But but under the leading of the Holy Spirit and in, in love, this psalm is a, a wonderful um, psalm to share with those in crisis or need. Well, let's take a closer look at the psalm. It's Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord... He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his, wing, and, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the error that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plagues that destroys at midday. So at all times, uh, morning, noon, and night, God's care is there. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked if you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge. Then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. God will send his angels to guard us. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra who will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. And he will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What a beautiful psalm of the promises and the care of God. The psalm can basically be broken down into two sections, verses 1 through 8 and verses 9 through 16. And the first two verses of both of these segments, like verses 1 and 2 and 9 and 10, carry similar parallel thoughts, reminding us and reiterating that God's protection rests among his people. Well, let's look at the first section. Um, we'll see in here that there are seven powerful symbols of God's protection. They are 
The first symbol is his shelter. He protects us with his, his shelter. We hear of many shelters today uh, with the, the heat that we've, we've had. You know, they open uh, shelters for, so people can come in and, and get cooled off. And then we have natural disasters, and so they have to open up shelters for people whose homes have been destroyed by tornadoes and, and other things. We definitely need shelters, don't we? Shelters from harm, from the, those natural-type um, disasters. And then the, um, with the new movie Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer um, as it comes out, remember about the, the story of the development of the, the nuclear bomb. Um, does anyone remember uh, n- nuclear um, bomb shelters or, or, um, or bomb shelters or, or drills in school where you hide under your desk and those kinds of things? Anyone remember some of those things? Well, I'm here today to tell you that hiding under the shelter of the Almighty God is much safer than any of these shelters. So then there's his, his shadow provides a shelter for us. Um, um, the shade that protects from the, the blazing sun or the torrential rains that we've seen, that, that um, we need shade, we need protection um, from the sun. I remember uh, on a, a mission trip uh, in the Dominican Republic, and we were, it was a, an interesting uh, place, and there was a wall, it was along the road called El Cayon, I think that's how you pronounce it, and, and it meant the road to nowhere. Can you imagine, say, what's your address? Oh, I live on the road to nowhere. And there was a wall, and on one side of the wall was, was a big estate, a big estate where the rich people lived. On the other side, on the road to nowhere, were these huts, just these um, places made of uh, cardboard and corrugated um, aluminum for the roofs and, and things like that. And we were working construction anyway. And, and I don't remember ever being, feeling the intense heat of the sun as I did there. And just a, a step in the shade, and it would be so much cooler and, and so much more refreshing just to get, uh, find that shelter, that, that shade, um, the shadow uh, that comes from that. And then another symbol is, is a refuge. This is the third week in the Psalms we've gone through. It's the third week talking about a refuge. And the long one dick. The Longman Dictionary describes a refuge as a place that provides protection or shelter from danger. A refuge. How comforting it is to know that God is that place of comfort and protection. The next symbol is a fortress. You know, it's, it's a, a protection, a wall around a, a city. Then his, his wings, the, the wings of God. What a beautiful symbol of God's cares. You think about an, an eagle, you know, a, a mother eagle or something, and, and she protects her, her babies um, under her wings, under the powerful wings of the bird. That's the way, uh, it's a beautiful description of God's care for us. Then there's a shield, a shield that is used in times of war. It's, to, it's used to protect from the, the arrows of the enemy. Well, certainly we live in um, a time of spiritual war, and we're to use the shield of faith to protect us from the fiery arrows of Satan. And certainly we're in the midst of a spiritual war war today and we should never forget that or underestimate that and we need spiritual weapons um, in the midst of this spiritual war and then um, the last symbol is a rampart Um, it's a a, a fort and I'm reminded of the the walls of um, a Fort Sumter. My son lives in Char- near Charleston, South Carolina, and one time visiting with him, we went out, and Fort Sumter is built out in the, in the 
that the big bay there in, in Charleston. And uh, we took a tour and went out there. And um, in April of 1861, Fort Sumter, it was uh, manned by Union troops. And, um, and the Confederate soldiers started uh, firing upon the war. And, I, and you can see, you know, the cannonball holes and the walls and the crumbling walls and things. And I, and I just thought, you know, what would it have felt like to be there knowing all that, seeing all these cannonballs and um, things um, coming in towards you. But the, it, that was the start of the, of the um, American Civil War. The walls were battered, but they still stood. They still stand firm today. And, and so are the walls, the ramparts of, of God. And they protect us from the ravages of spiritual war that's all around us. And so as we consider these seven ways of protection, these symbols of protection that God um, uh, talks about in this, in this psalm, Let's be inspired. Let us be encouraged that God is our protector. So why should we fear? Why should we uh, give in to anxiety? Why should we be overwhelmed with things that are going on in the world? Well, the reality is there's some good reasons for that. And the psalm, psalmist mentions two threats that come to us. In verses 3 and then 5 and 6, he shows us the reality of the two threats in life that we face. The threat from enemies of nature, the, the fowler's snare and the arrows, and then the terror of disease and epidemics from pestilence and plagues. You know, there, it's a dangerous place in this world in which we live. And after COVID-19, I certainly read these passages and these, these plagues of, of God in, in a different light than I did before. I thought, oh, yeah, these are things that just happened in the, in the past, in the ancient days, but plagues are, are still among us. But we're assured once again of God's protection at all times of the day. Notice he doesn't leave anything out. He talks about during the night there's protection. During the day there's protection. During the darkness. During the midday. At all times God's protection is there. As I was reflecting on uh, 91 verse 7. It, it talks about uh, the reference to a thousand and to ten thousand falling. People are falling all around. You look around, a, a thousand are gone, and then no, ten thousand are gone. Um, and it, it just kind of reminded me of what we experienced around COVID, and, and people were dying all around us, and thousands, even millions, were infected. However, at this crucial time, I would like to suggest that we look at things from a different perspective. Joshua 23.10 says, One of you routs a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So uh, Joshua is saying here as he was leading the people into the, into the promised land, he was, you know, after 40 years of wandering around in the, in the wilderness, they went into the promised land, and there were giants in that land. There were problems all around them. But Joshua says, one of you routes a thousand. You know, if you're on God's side, you're always in the majority. So one of you routes a thousand. Why? Because the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. God keeps his word. And then in the New Testament, Jesus says, and again I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. And while this passage doesn't directly, uh, it, it deals with um, sorting out sin and relationship problems in the church, it tells us that we can find God's help and guidance whenever we join together in prayer. And so may I humbly suggest that we become even more of a people of prayer. May we find a friend that, that you can pray with, you know, uh, 
uh, when you're going through trials and tribulations, that you can come together and, and pray together in times of crisis. Maybe you can seek out a, a person who is more vulnerable and join together in prayer for them as you reach out and encourage them in prayer. So let's pray together. Let's pray even more for one another. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for families in general because they're under attack uh, today. And then let's pray specifically for those who have lost loved ones or are going through the grieving process. Our prayers can reach out to others because the living God still answers prayer today. Let us also pray for our future, and let's pray for spiritual revival. So then let's pick up in section 2, verses 9 through 16. If, notice this is conditional, if you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. As I mentioned earlier, uh, verses 9 and 10 correspond with verses 1 and 2, and, and they reassure us of God's protection. That protection is further emphasized when God talks about his holy angels. You know, God sends his angels out among us uh, to protect us. The New International Bible Commentary said, God's tender care is such that he even supplies a celestial bodyguard around the believer who carry him along a rock-strewn road. Isn't that a pretty picture? A celestial bodyguard. Some believe that Psalm 91 is also a messianic psalm, partly because Satan quoted from this psalm to Jesus in his temptation in the wilderness. And, and Luke, uh, when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and, you know, he was hungry, he had been all alone. You know, if you look at the barren land and you think of just living there for 40 days. And, and uh, so Satan came to him at the end and, and they, he tempted Jesus. And one of the ways he did it, he said, for it is written, Satan knows scripture. He knows it well. And he twists it and he distorts it and he uses it. Um, to pervert God's people and to get them away from following the one true God. But anyway, Satan says, For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So Satan said, Why don't you just throw yourself down and, and everyone will see how great you are and you'll be popular and, and all this. Why don't you just do that? And how did Jesus respond? Well, Jesus refused to be drawn into the temptation. He knew God's word, and he knew the truth, and he knew how Satan was twisting and distorting God's word, and he rebuked Satan, and to rebuke means stop it. Stop it. And then um, um, he, uh, he just wanted to follow God's will, no matter what it would cost him. So in these difficult times, let's be grounded in the promises of God's word. And let's share his powerful word whenever we can. Let's humble ourselves in his presence and seek to honor him in every way. 
Psalm 91, 13 brings up the challenge of wild beasts. It's a dangerous world out there. As reflected with the, you know, a, a ferocious lion, you think what could be more terrifying than coming upon a lion in, in the wilderness? You know, it's not, not something many of us um, experience, but uh, it once was more of a part of life. Or the poison of a, of a cobra, you know, seeing a poisonous snake. I don't know about you, but... I don't like snakes. Uh, poisonous or not, I don't want to be around them. But, but there are dangers in the land. Um, but through these references, it reminds us that um, in 1 Peter it says, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, he's out to steal, to kill, and destroy. Never underestimate that fact. We are in a spiritual war. Um, but take heart. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. In Genesis 3, Satan came to Adam and Eve in the guise of a snake in the, as a serpent. So we've got a lion and a serpent. Both of those were used in this psalm, talking about the, the dangers. But we can have assurance as we overcome these dangers through the power of God. And then in, uh, finally, the final three uh, verses um, of Psalm 91 talk about the blessings that God will um, uh, bestow upon his people. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So there are eight blessings here. And notice that these are conditional blessings. They require us to do three things. They're not just automatic. One, we're called to love the Lord to acknowledge his name, and to call upon him. Love, acknowledge who he is, and call upon him. And then here are the eight blessings that will happen if you do that. One, I will rescue him. I will protect him. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. And I will show him my salvation. In closing, I, I just pray that the thoughts of this sermon will encourage you and give you a new hope for today. I pray it will help you to face whatever you're facing in life even in the midst of very difficult challenges. But there is one thing for certain. Death will come to every one of us. Every one of us will die. Even if God protects us and, and heals us from, from one thing, at some point, we're going to die. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But Lazarus eventually died again. So at some point, we're all going to die. And that's a part of God's plan because we're called as, as aliens just passing through. So we shouldn't get so comfortable in this life that we don't long for that one that is to come. Life is temporary. The next life is eternal. Isn't it a great blessing to know that we have a Savior who has opened up the portals to heaven where we can dwell with him forever and ever? Therefore, let no, cloud of fear, let no fear cloud your heart, for nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if maybe you don't have that assurance of eternal life in, in your heart right now, let me encourage you to open your heart to Jesus Christ and invite your Savior in. Confess your sins. 
be cleansed of those sins and healed of all unrighteousness. And you will receive the gift of eternal life. And by the way, in eternity, you know, we might be able to meet the person who wrote, we might find out who wrote this psalm, and, and we can thank him for writing it and, and share ways that perhaps uh, his words have impacted our lives and the lives of others, all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you, and may God protect you. Let us go to him in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that we live in a, a dangerous world, and yet our hope rests in you. Thank you for this psalm and for your word and for your many promises that you meet us where we are and you promise to protect us and to keep us and to hold us uh, securely uh, in your hands. And I just think about that, that grip that will never let go. And once we've accepted you as our Savior and Lord, there's nothing that can break that bond and, and separate us um, from your love. How comforting that is. Father, I just pray that your words will bring hope and your promises will comfort all of us, especially as we go through the trials and the difficulties of life. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will also bring comfort and peace and joy and strength um, to, to face what we need to face. Thank you for calling us into a body, into the church of Jesus Christ, where we can um, love one another and care for one another in times of need. So bless us, Lord, strengthen us, and encourage us as your people. For we pray all these things in the wonderful and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us in our worship service today, a day of celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I have a couple birthdays to celebrate. Just to remind you that there'll be a, a, a reception for Anne's 90th birthday um, just out in the narthex as, as we leave. Um, but as you go, go in the knowledge that God has sent guardian angels to watch out over you, and that God goes before us. And so we can trust in him. We can lean on him in the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ. So go in peace, love your neighbor, and spread the good news. Amen.